Good morning, everyone. Welcome. If you're looking for becoming a lioness mother, you are in the right place. And it's my pleasure to introduce your speaker, Linda Siegel. Um, she's a professor in the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology and Special Education at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada, where she holds the Dorothy Lamb Chair in Special Education. She's conducted research on the development of reading and of mathematical concepts, language development, dyslexia, mathematical learning disabilities, early identification, and intervention to prevent reading difficulties and the development of reading and language skills in children learning English as a second language. She's consulted on the development of reading skills in elementary school-aged ch children in China, Barbados, Brazil, Air Argentina, Switzerland, and many places in the U.S. and Canada. And in 2010, she was awarded the gold medal for distinguished contributions to Canadian psychology from the Canadian Psychological Association. And in 2012, she received the inaugural Eminent Researcher Award from the organization Learning Difficulties Australia. And she's been awarded an honorary degree from the University of... You said... Oh, you wanted to say it, though. How is it really said? <clears throat> like I was going to be able to say that. <laughs> um, I know Linda also. She is um, the editor of Perspectives. That's IDA's uh, quarterly quarterly um, newsletter, and we serve together on the publications team, and she's really fun. So enjoy this session. You're in for a really good one. So please help me welcome Linda to the podium. <clears throat> Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming uh, so early in the morning um, and on the last day of the conference. Um, the title of this session is Becoming a Lioness Mother or a Lion Father, uh, How to Protect and Support Your Dyslexic Child. So I chose the image of a lioness because I want to convey what it is that you need to do to deal with all of the aspects of parenting a dyslexic child. And I'm going to show you two short videos. And in the videos, you will see the way a lioness behaves, protecting her cubs against a crocodile or other lions because what happens when food is scarce is that the other lions try to kill and eat the young. Uh, you might think of that in terms of the sc sometimes scarce resources that are available to help dyslexic children. Um, so here is the, oh, and watch in a second video uh, how the lioness deals with the bullies that are trying to attack her cub. Wildlife photographer Pia Dyerix captured a series of amazing photos of a lioness in Botswana attacking a crocodile that was threatening her pride. A lion's pride is the social group they form and live their lives with, including their cubs. The photographer was in Botswana observing the lioness and her pride crossing a riverbed. When the crocodile appeared, the lioness jumped and grabbed the croc by its mouth. The two battled it out, biting each other, until the lioness ran off. Diarix told press that she hardly even noticed what happened since it happened so quickly. She told press, it was only when I downloaded my pictures later that I saw what had happened. Okay, did you see how fearless she was and the, the uh, long jump that she did to um, chase the crocodile? The lionesses brace for a fight, but they won't start one. The males taste the air, 
and savor the scent of what will soon be their pride. But they don't attack. Overwhelmed by curiosity, young Ada tests the waters. It's a mistake. Mother marks the male. As Kali moves toward her cub, every muscle ready to fight. unharmed. But now, it's war. The lionesses will risk their lives to protect the cubs. They stay low and submissive, but they do not back down. survive another attack the pride needs so you saw the way that she stood up look at the difference in size between the female lion the lioness and uh, the male lions how um, she stood up to them well this reminds me of some of the school meetings that I've attended, um, both as a psychologist and a parent. You walk into a room, and it's like the Inquisition. There are five people um, there, all looking at you and waiting to uh, hear your response to their sometimes um probing and provocative questions. So I'd like to describe um, a typical school meeting. And, uh, well, it goes like this. Mrs. Siegel, you're here because you have concerns about your daughter Tiffany. Tiffany is in first grade, and it's March, and you're concerned about the difficulties that she's having reading, uh, learning to read. Well, we share your concerns, and we would like to do everything we can to help you. Um, we've arranged for uh, an Orton Gillingham trained teacher to come to the school, and uh, to work with your daughter and some other children uh, about a half hour a day for five days a week. How many of you have had that experience? Well, um, I think that is 
a wonderful experience, but in my uh, in my dealings with school districts, it's fairly unusual. And for those of you who raised your hand, I would suggest that maybe we should all move to those districts. Um, But I think the experience of many parents is that it's really not like that. Um, So what... The reason I use the image of the lioness is that you are faced with some real, um, very significant challenges. And you need to have confidence in yourself and to really believe in what you're doing. I would suggest that if you go to any school meetings, you take a friend along uh, and become informed about um, dyslexia or whatever the learning uh, challenges are. And the International Dyslexia Association has wonderful resources, both print resources and uh, on the website, and it's really important to have those kinds of uh, resources when you're talking to the school. Okay, so with these challenges, um, it's really important to find the strength, find your strengths. And uh, I happen to be rooming with uh, Phyllis from Kenya, and uh, she has experienced some really significant struggles in getting even beginning to get um, dyslexia recognized in Kenya. Uh, And um, she says it's really, she's really had to use all her inner resources, and it's been quite a struggle. So the first part of this struggle and the first ammunition that you need is recognizing your child's strengths and talents. And I know that you've been told this probably over and over again, um, but uh, it's a really important message. So in my experience, uh, people with dyslexia may have significant talents in uh, one of these areas, art, music, sports, visual spatial skills, mechanical skills. Now, in terms of music, it's often misinterpreted because there are many dyslexic musicians cannot read music. And it's often, especially when in schools, that reading music is what is has become critical to playing an instrument. Well, it's not the case. Um, About 50 to 60 percent of dyslexic musicians cannot read music. And a very famous example is Dave Brubeck, uh, the, the great jazz musician. He went to the conservatory in New York to become trained as a classical musician, he could not read music. And in order to graduate from the conservatory, you need to be able to pass uh, a sight sight music reading course. Well, he couldn't pass the course. And what they finally decided was to change that requirement so he could graduate. Uh, so, um, in my experience, dyslexic individuals often want to play the guitar or the drums because it's not a particular advantage um, to read music. Now, all of these, understanding these talents and gifts is important, but it doesn't negate the necessity of learning to read. Uh, One mother I talked to, whose 
uh, child was an excellent uh, soccer player, uh, said, you know, this is great. I, I understand his strengths, but he still has to learn to read his contract. And this is um, critical. So, yes, it's fine. Pay attention to the strengths, but you still have to learn to read. And these are just some professions where these visual spatial skills are um, really critical. And uh, with an elementary school child, it's not particularly necessary to start thinking about a career. But I think with uh, children, uh, with as they get older, it's really something to think about. So this is a drawing um, done by an eight-year-old dyslexic girl. Notice the the proportions, the expression that's conveyed, the three-dimensional uh, aspect of it. Uh, this I had tested this uh, girl and. Uh, she was waiting for her mother to come and pick her up. So she asked for paper and a marker. And in five minutes, she s- sketched this drawing. Uh, what is particularly interesting about this is that the school had no idea of her talents in this area. Uh, her mother brought in this drawing. This is another drawing that she did. Remember, she's eight years old. And if you can't read the writing, uh, she couldn't either. But what is critical is what is conveyed in this drawing. You notice the girl, and she has a smile on her face. Notice also the boy, who looks like he's falling down. Well, He's one of her classmates, and he called her a dummy and a retard, as is the experience of um, many dyslexic children. And she kicked him, and he fell down. And he's telling, she's telling this story to her mother. Well, obviously, that's not the solution to the problem, but um, this is an illustration of some of the experiences that um, dyslexic children have. Okay. Um, I'm sure that many of you recognize this painting. It's Guernica by Picasso. And it's a, not only is it a historic painting in the the world of um, modern art, but also in the history um, of warfare, because this uh, the town of Guernica in Spain was bombed um, by a combination of the Germans and the uh, Spanish forces um, in 1937. And it's the first uh, bombing, aerial bombing, of civilians at um, basically during the Spanish Civil War, precursor to World War II. So this was an attack on civilians rather than on the military. The reason I show you this painting, because Picasso is an example of a very talented artist um, who was dyslexic. He learned to read very late. Um, throughout school, he had spelling and writing problems, and he hated school. He played sick. He had to be dragged to school. Uh, I think some of those emotions um, are familiar to you. But he was punished in school because of his difficulties. He was made to sit in a small windowless room uh, as, this, as if this was going to solve 
uh, his reading and writing problems. Um, he, at that point in time, you, to get into uh, high school, secondary school, you had to pass an entrance examination. And he failed the first time he took it. But the second time, the examiner took pity on him and left the answer sheet so he could see it. And uh, he was able to pass the examination. So, um, as I said, I illustrate, I use this illustration to um, show some of the talents that dyslexics can have. But you saw from the uh, illustration of um, the young girl what she experienced. And um, the, the experience of dealing with bullies is so common among dyslexic children. Now, Children, and by the way, if you read any accounts of a dyslexic person growing up, you will see how much they have experienced um, at the hands of bullies. It's really, and children don't want to talk about what they're experienced because they feel that it's somehow their fault for doing it, for uh, being the victim. So, I think it's really important to warn your child that this might happen. Um, Now, you might argue, well, why, if it hasn't happened, do you want um, to tell him or her? But I I think it's so common um, that in children can be confused by it, upset by it. Uh, It's really important to warn them about it, and tell them not to be uh, afraid to talk about it. Of course, it's easier to say that um, than for them to actually do it, but it really is important. So what another experience that dyslexic children have is being uh, subjected to peer pressure. And some of them have told me this is particularly uh, a problem in early adolescence uh, when before their judgment has matured, um, that you get a group of uh, children standing around in front of a store and they send the dyslexic child in to shoplift. Um, the dyslexic child wants to be uh, accepted and uh, acknowledged by his peers, and so this is a typical scenario. Um, again, discussing the peer pressure with your child is probably uh, a really important idea. Now, It's, as we all know, learning the basic reading skills are really difficult for a dyslexic child. And we need to recognize those struggles and to give praise and tangible rewards. Before I had children, I had this idealistic idea that um, the desire to learn should come with, from within. And um, I learned after uh, many years that it just isn't going to happen. Uh, I recently worked with uh, an eight-year-old boy, very seriously dyslexic, just is ha- was having so much trouble um, with learning the sounds of the letters. A really, a real struggle. And he had a very good Orton-Gillingham tutor, but um, he was struggling. And he really, uh, really began to hate 
the, the lessons, even though he was making progress. So she hit upon the idea of giving him a, re, a reward that was uh, he could play the video games that he liked for 15 minutes and um, he was essentially, if you want to put it in those terms, being bribed to learn. But how many of us would work if we weren't paid? I mean, I think these kind of, we have to recognize the role that um, tangible rewards uh, have in this process. But also, and uh, I think if you talk to dyslexics, what you see is that persistence is learning to keep on with that struggle as difficult as it might be is really important. Um, Now, learning self-advocacy is also important. Uh, I have a student um, working on her doctorate now. Catherine and Catherine gave me permission to talk about this. Uh, Catherine is seriously dyslexic. And she has, uh, in university, she got a degree in computer science. But in order to do that, she had to ask for extra time. She had to ask for uh, help with um, any kind of writing that she had to do. She still struggles with writing in terms of uh, spelling, composition, uh, she has very good ideas, but putting them down on paper is difficult. I think you're familiar with that. So she has learned to, first of all, disclose to her uh, professors that she has this disability and to ask for um, extra time for assignments, etc. cetera. Uh, she's learned to ask for help with her writing, from the uh, appropriate clinic at the university. So there's a whole, the whole issue of disclosure um, is a complicated one because I've also worked with people who have jobs where it's important that their employers understand the dyslexia, but they're often afraid to disclose it because of um, they may lose their jobs. Um, so this whole idea of disclosure uh, has to be um, used very carefully. Catherine was fearless in her uh, determination and her self-advocacy, but um, she had a lot of backing from supportive parents and from uh, the local um, uh, center for students with disabilities. So uh, it, it's not easy to do this. Uh, it's becoming more and more accepted. Now, one of the issues um, is always extra time for examinations. Um, we've done some research where we took dyslexic university students and non-dyslexic university students, and we gave them a reading comprehension test, and we gave it either in the set amount of time or we allowed them to take as long as they wanted to do it. So this would be something like an examination that they have. Well, not surprisingly, we found that the dyslexics did uh, much better when they had extra time. We also found that when they had the fixed amount of time, most of what they did, they got right. They just didn't do very much because they're slow readers. So what we did, um, we then looked at the non-dyslexic students and how they did with extra time. And many of them um, did more poorly they had lower scores with the extra time. And why is that? Well, it's 
multiple choice and many multiple choice questions, if you look at them carefully, um, you can find perhaps other meanings uh, and uh, you overinterpret the question. So extra time doesn't do everybody uh, good and it may do some harm. So uh, we're gradually um, getting extra time is becoming accepted, but there are still at the university level many professors who are very uh, reluctant to give extra time. Um, so um, I know when I had to take the licensing exam to become a psychologist, uh, I finished the exam very quickly. And I thought, okay, I'll go and check my work. And I know um, that I changed some of the right answers to wrong an- answers because I had this extra time. So extra time is not always a bonus. Now, one of the solutions that uh, one of my colleagues has come up with is to simply give everybody all the time that they want. So instead of making it a two-hour examination, give people five hours or whatever. Um, uh, that solution is not popular with university administrators and with um, these uh, various high-stakes testing. Okay, now... One of the experiences that dyslexics have is um, that they find, most of them find that they study much better with a group and that discussing the answers and working with a group is beneficial. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of or experienced problem-based learning, but uh, this is especially good for dyslexics. And basically it's working around a specific case. Um, I learned about it when I was on the faculty of the place where it started, McMaster University in uh, Ontario, Canada. And it's gradually becoming... A, It was first used in this medical school, and now it's being used in various professional programs. We uh, have one cohort in our teacher education program where we use problem-based learning. And this is, there are no textbooks, required reading, examinations. The students are given a problem, a case to work with, and In our case, it was a classroom where uh, many things were happening at the same time. You had some uh, ESL students and, uh, for example, a student with an attention deficit. Uh, You had um, a certain curriculum. These were hypothetical situations, but they mirrored what went on in a classroom. So the students were given some... Uh, issues that they had to address and that they worked on their own with the guidance of a tutor um, to solve these problems and to deal with the issues in the case. And because of this group work and the emphasis on individual contributions, this was um, really a good situation for dyslexic children and dyslexic students, I should say. So it's uh, really appropriate for professional programs. It's it's not good for uh, learning basic skills. But uh, I wish that there was more of it because I think all students um, benefit it. And the research shows that students enjoy it more But most importantly, they remember much more of what they learned um, in this kind of uh, group work situation. So adult dyslexics have said repeatedly um, that, that their parents have to learn to let go and, yes, to support them, but also 
as one student said, uh, let them fly. Uh, when I was uh, uh, a young child, we lived in um, a townhouse, and there was an air conditioner on the second floor window, and birds had built a nest under the air conditioner. And I came out one morning to go to school, and the mother bird was pushing the bird out of the nest. And uh, she pushed the bird, and the bird fell, uh, and I thought the bird was going to land uh, on the ground, but just before the bird reached the ground, it took off and um, flew away. So um, this is what, it's a, it's a very delicate balance between the support uh, and letting them fly. Okay, um, learning to use humor um, to uh, diffuse situations or to help understand what's going on. Uh, one young person said to me, I'm not a slow learner, I'm a fast forgetter. <laughs> and I think that sums it up. Um, okay. So whenever you can. Uh, and in my experience, uh, there are many people with learning disabilities who have especially good senses of humor. So that is an important gift. Okay, sometimes you have to reframe the problem. So if somebody like a teacher says you're disorganized, um, you can say, well, I can do many different things at the same time. Now we call it multitasking. Um, if somebody says you have an attention deficit, you can say, I do not tire easily. Um, so it's a matter of recognizing what the difficulties are, but try and put put a positive spin on it. Um, if you read the accounts of uh, many adults who um, are dyslexic, they say that it gave them more sympathy for other people and helped them understand other people. They became more interested in people, and many of them chose to go into um, various helping professions, including teaching. Um, it, all, many, and the parents say this also, that it did make them stronger. So another issue you're going to, go, you are going to deal with, probably you've dealt with it already, why can't I read like, like everyone else? Um, will I get better? And why me? Um, now, why can't I read like everyone else? I think we all would say there's, we all have different brains. And um, although you can play soccer very well or whatever, you still, um, you have trouble with reading. But I think the important thing is to hold out a promise of help. Um, and that can be difficult to do uh, because many schools are either not in a position or don't understand dyslexia and don't do it. Will I get better? Well, the evidence we have is that if you're dyslexic, you have it for life, uh, which doesn't mean that it is um, a barrier but it's something that you will have to deal with all your life. Um, in my experience, and maybe things will change as we learn more, but spelling never improves very much. Uh, people come along with spelling programs, and um, I think they may help some children, but 
spelling is always a problem, handwriting is a problem, and fortunately, we have computers, uh, and it's really important to learn good keyboarding skills. Uh, as for why me, well, it comes down to basically and um, that what we know about dyslexia is um, it runs in families. And uh, you might get the good genes for music, but you also get the genes for dyslexia. So this is, uh, you know, you can't change your eye color unless you get some special contact lenses. Um, you can't change your height. Um, so this is something that is really in the genes. And the issue is to work around it. Uh, we know um, that uh, anxiety and depression and various kinds of um, emotional difficulties often co-occur with dyslexia. And you may not see this right away, but as a person experiences dyslexia more and more, you get uh, the increasing manifestation of these problems. Now, I and other researchers have also found that many adolescent suicides are a result of dyslexia, uh, that the learning problem has not been properly identified and treated. And this is a, re a very, obviously, a very serious problem. It's a nightmare for families. Um, that's why one of the many reasons we advocate early identification uh, and early intervention. So this whole issue of talents is um, important, but it's also <coughs> we don't want to exaggerate this and to say that if you're dyslexic, you're gifted. That doesn't work that way. But recognizing whatever talents the dyslexic person has are is really important. However, um, it is also important that the child be allowed to pursue these talents and to go to music lessons or soccer practice or whatever it is and not be forced to stay home and do homework and work on uh, the, the, the reading, the spelling, the writing. Yet you have to do some of that, but really uh, support um, the child in terms of uh, developing those gifts. So I'm going to end with a commercial. This is a, a book that I've written, which um, is in the IDA bookstore. And I explore all these issues in more depth in the book and some others also. Uh, it was published until last Wednesday by Pacific Educational Press, uh, which went out of business as I was flying here to the conference. But uh, the International Dyslexia Association is going to um, publish it, uh, and so it is available from them. Okay, um, so uh, we have time for questions, comments. I knew that my dad was dyslexic and he had 
several family members with dyslexic and then later found out that also comes on my husband's side, and so we have 100 percent. But I want you guys to not get discouraged because I did go to another conference that said the number one indicator for success of a dyslexic person is family support. And I'll tell you that both my husband and I had family support. My husband didn't start reading until fourth grade. He did terrible in Spanish, all these sorts of things, you know. But his parents never said he couldn't do something. And he went on to go to Stanford and get his master's in Mandarin, which people told him he would never succeed in a foreign language. He went on to UCLA and got his law degree. I struggled in school. I hated school. I wanted some fun. I did end up doing well in school, but for the wrong reasons. You know, I didn't necessarily learn. I just learned for the test. And so I want something different for my kids. I want them to go for the love of learning. I found actually a really good school that promotes that. They want to instill the love for learning. So with that being said, you know, I mean, I went on to college and, you know, I graduated at 20 years old in three years because my mom told me that was something that I needed to do. It was a measure of perseverance. So if you can just instill in your kids, you know, whatever it takes, but never define them by their dyslexia. You know, I mean, my friend who is a tutor, I was kind of getting wrapped up in all of it. Like, what do I need to do for each of these kids? You know, like, oh, my God, oh, my God, they're so far behind. And when she just, like, hit me over the head and said, dyslexia is only one aspect of each of your kids. You know, like, it's not what defines them. Yes, it's obviously a struggle, and I can't let them fall too far behind. And they've made great strides, but there's so many other things about being a kid, you know. And so, unfortunately, our biggest problem in our house is the bullying that happens within the house because they hear it so much at school that then they come home and do it to each other. Oh, you're stupid, or oh, you're so slow, or that sort of thing. So you really just need to treat them as a person, and their socio-emotional well-being is, like, the number one priority, and then anything else that you can do for them will kind of work itself out. But don't be so overwhelmed. I mean, it is overwhelming, but just treat them as a person. Now, that's a very important message. And, by the way, I do some research with English language learners, and we find that if you teach them properly, bilingual dyslexics are, they have better reading, spelling, phonological awareness skills than monolingual dyslexics. So learning a foreign language is something that can be good for dyslexics if they learn it properly. And that's, unfortunately, that the emphasis in the beginning should be on speaking because many of them have very good musical skills. And that's one of the issues in learning a foreign language that seems to be correlated with musical skills. So, again, it's, but it's a matter of teaching them properly. But the overall message is, yes, pay attention to all aspects of your child's life. Yeah, the dyslexia has to be dealt with, but also the particular strength. I'm sure you have a whole long list of the strengths of your children. And that's right. Family support is so important. And often, and this is, if you read the accounts of dyslexic adults when they've grown up, also sometimes some teachers can have very profound effects on them. And you found a school that really supports that. What I wish is that we really could do this in the public schools because, unfortunately, there are many families that really can't afford this. Okay, but it's still 
a public school. So. Okay. Yes. Um, actually, there is a separate math disability, and many of the dyslexics that I see, the trouble that they have with math is not the reasoning. It's the actual writing the numbers. And um, I think what you need to do is to look very carefully at what is giving them the difficulty. Uh, for example, we find that um, many of them do very well in geometry because it's reasoning. Your actual calculation is not that important. Uh, I'm a big fan of calculators. Um, and it's becoming less and less controversial. But uh, I have a friend who's a very successful mathematician, and she doesn't know her multiplication tables. So if you ask her what 7 times 9 is, she takes out her calculator and does it. So I said, well, what do you do if you don't have your calculator or uh, the calculator, the batteries run out or something? She said, well, I do 7 times 10 and take away 7. So she really understands the concepts behind numbers. So uh, there's something that I've encountered, which I think is uh, very good for uh, children, for all children learning math, and it's called jump math. And you can Google it and find out about it. It was developed by a mathematician, and it breaks the math down into very small pieces and builds gradually on those pieces. Yes. Yes, and the teacher's manuals are available for free on the Internet. And the workbooks, um, they charge a minimal charge, basically what it costs to print them. So it's it, it was developed because um, John Mighton, the person who developed a, a mathematician, uh, hated math in school. And he was very unsuccessful in math until he really he said, I'm going to conquer this. And basically, he tries to get, and he develops the program to get at the basic understanding, but not using too much verbal language, which is the problem for at least some dyslexics, but actually looking at the reasoning which is a strength of many dyslexics. So um, it's, uh, and, and the research, that's, it's a fairly new program, the research that's coming out has shown that it's very successful. You can, it's sort of like the Orton-Gillingham or the Linda Mood Bell for math. Um, and uh, it's, but it's designed to be used in the classroom. You can use it in small groups. But it's really, it, the teachers have to be trained in it. It's not a, a, it's not complicated, but like anything, you want the teachers um, to be trained in it. And, uh, and many of the workshops are, are free, so it's not, they're not, it's not a profit-making organization. Oh, yes. Yeah, any kind of rote learning. And that's why uh, many of them 
have trouble with the way we teach foreign language, which is a lot of memory, rote memory, and dyslexics and actually other learning disabilities, the rote memory, that's the problem. So that's why if you, if you teach uh, languages properly to dyslexics, um, emphasizing uh, the kind of the, the, the spoken language um, rather than going right away to the written language, as many of us did when we learned a foreign language, that um, dyslexics, uh, again, if it's properly taught, um, can do reasonably well in a foreign language. And we have an example. Now, I, I also have to ask you, what about the, ma- the writing of Mandarin? Oh, okay. Yeah, it does have a, a phonological component to it, but it's not like an alphabet. There are characters that uh, sometimes tell you how to pronounce it, but it's it's not terribly predictable. So, um, and some of the characters, at least, uh, started off from pictures, so you could recognize um, the the pictures there. Um, if you look at the character for woman. Um, you can tell that it's a woman. Um, so uh, it's uh, actually there was some research a long time ago that um, dyslexic uh, children were able to learn um, Chinese characters more easily than non-dyslexics. Um, it, it really hasn't been followed up. I don't know if that's true. Okay. So I think um, we have to finish now. So thank you all very much. <laughs>